Okay. So I'm going to put on the live transcript just in case something goes wrong with the sound. That way we will have some subtitles to follow. They could be funny sometimes, but you know, you get it. <laughs> okay, we still have some people joining us. Okay, well, welcome everyone, one more time. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this exclusive and very special Indelible Evening Session, in which I am delighted to welcome our three special guests in the mystery, crime, and fantasy uh, panel. So today we have with us authors Lee Perry, Heidi, Hello. <laughs> and Josh Pachter. Hi, Josh. Hiya. And uh, Jasper Ford, who will be joining us pretty soon. So uh, before we start, I'd just like to take a little moment to do a little bit of reminders of some housekeeping things. So firstly, make sure to keep your mics muted during the talk in order to avoid any interfering background noise. Uh, please save the questions for the Q&A session after the talk. However, you may feel free to add your comments and anything you would like in the chat box. But we prefer it not for the questions not to get lost, so you could leave those until the very end. And um, you could also use the microphone to ask the question during the Q&A session if you would like to. So, um, are we ready? So I will first start by introducing our speakers. I will introduce Lee Perry. Lee Perry slash Tony L.P. Kellner is two authors in one. As Lee, she writes the family skeleton mysteries featuring adjunct English professor Georgia Thackeray and her skeletal pal, Sid. The sixth, the skeleton stuffed to stocking is the most recent. Actually, we could take a look at Sid in the background, right? He's right there behind Lee on the printer. So everybody meet Sid. Hi, Sid. <laughs> As Tony, she's written 11 mystery novels and co-edited urban fantasy anthologies with Charlene Harris. Under both names, she writes short stories. She's won the Agatha Award and an RT Book Club Lifetime Achievement Award and has been nominated for Anthony, the McCavity, and Derringer Awards. Forthcoming is a family skeleton short story in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, and she's working on another family skeleton novel. She lives in the state of Massachusetts in the U.S. with her husband, fellow author Stephen P. Kellner Jr., and their daughters. Between them, they have a whole lot of books. So, Lee, we are very happy and honored to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. This is great. And next, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Josh Pachter. Josh is an author, translator. I'm sorry. Um, it's telling me something that I need to. OK, sorry, Josh. Um, Josh is an author, translator, and editor of short crime fiction. His stories have been published in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, and many other periodicals, anthologies, and year's best collections since the 1960s. And his translations of stories by Dutch and Flemish authors appear regularly in Ellery Queen's Passport to Crime Department. As an editor, his recent titles include Only the Good Die Young, crime fiction inspired by the songs of Billy Joel and the Beat of Black Wings, crime fiction inspired by the songs of Joni Mitchell, from Untreed Reads, The Great Filling Station Holdup, crime fiction inspired by the songs of Jimmy Buffett from Down and Out Books, Amsterdam Noir from Akashic Books, and The Misadventures of Nara Wolf from the Mysterious Press. Last year, the Short Mystery Fiction Society awarded him its Golden Derringer Award for Lifetime Achievement. So again, I would like to welcome you both. And uh, yeah, uh, Jasper Ford is still not here yet, but I guess we can start anyway. 
All right, so uh, perhaps we can start with each of you telling us a little bit more about your work for those who are not familiar with your writing. So how would you describe your work? Shall I go? Yep. Exactly. Um, I started out writing uh, cozy mysteries. I've written two mystery series as Lee, as, excuse me, as Tony Kellner, which was a, one was a Southern American uh, mystery series set in North Carolina. And then I wrote a, a a shorter series set in the Boston area. But what I'm working on now is the Family Skeleton series, which I probably have the most fun with, which is about uh, an adjunct English professor, which is an English professor who doesn't have a full-time job, but has to wander back and forth. And um, her best friend, Sid, who is a walking, talking skeleton. Needless to say, these are not dark and gritty novels. They're, they're, they're on the lighter side, but they're a lot of fun to write. Um, so I've had six of those come out, plus the short story that's forthcoming. I'm working on a new one. Uh, my other work has been uh, co-edited in urban fantasy anthologies, what they tend to call dark fantasy in other parts of the world, I've noticed, uh, about vampires and werewolves and stuff. I did, we did seven anthologies together, and which taught me that while with my novels, I might stick a little closer to home. With my short fiction, I'll, I'll do anything in a short story because it's so much fun to experiment. So my short stories are where I generally go to experiment and try something new. And my novels, I stay a little bit closer to home other than the walking, talking skeleton part. That's kind of a capsule, I guess. So um, <clears throat> primarily I'm a short story writer. I, I did collaborate on one novel with a, a Belgian author, Bavo Doha, which is probably the, the most high concept novel in the history of literature. I can tell you the entire plot line in five words, zombie cop, Chases Serial Killer. Uh, that was published about I think, eight years ago by Simon & Schuster. But other than that, I write short stories. I've been doing it, as Ula said, for quite some time now. My first piece of published fiction appeared in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine in 1968. I was 16 years old uh, when I wrote it, which made me the second youngest person who's ever published in EQMM. It was a guy named James Yaffe who had a short story in the magazine when he was 50, damn him. Uh, but I, I, I write uh, mostly for Ellery Queens. I also I do write for Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Weekly, uh, Black Cat Mystery Magazine, some others. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who uh, uh, really doesn't have a routine as a writer. I write when a story comes to me and says, please write me. Uh, more of a a regular thing for me is translating and editing. I translate primarily for EQMM's Passport to Crime Department, although I've also translated for Alfred Hitchcock's and other, other places. Uh, but uh, Queens is wonderful in that every issue, which means six times a year, they publish a story that was written in a language other than English. Uh, and I have translated for them from so far seven languages, uh, Dutch primarily, Flemish, South uh, uh, Afrikaans from South Africa, uh, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, and Chinese. Next up, I think, is probably going to be German. I just, in fact, got a story uh, from a German author today with a request that I, I take a look and see if I thought it would be right for EQMM. And then I, I lately, I've been doing a lot of editing of short story collections, and I've been having a lot of fun with, with those. These inspired by anthologies, inspired by the, the songs of Joni Mitchell, Billy Joel, Jimmy Buffett have been great fun. Uh, and then the next one up is very different. It's coming out in September. It's called Monkey Business, crime fiction inspired by the films of the Marx Brothers. And that one also was great, great fun to work on. That's a little thumbnail sketch of what I do. You. That's fantastic. Uh, now I want to ask you both, in what ways do you feel that your writing may have changed over the years? I think with my early, you want to go Josh? No, go ahead, Lee. La ladies first. Um, when I started writing, and I found this true of a lot of mystery authors, the, the first series character is a lot like them. So in my case, it was a North Carolinian living in Massachusetts. I was a North Carolinian living in Massachusetts, working in the computer industry, married to an academic. My husband didn't end up staying an academic. He left academia a long time ago, but at the time we thought he was going to be in academia. Um, and going back to North Carolina with an extended eccentric family, 
which is not just similar to my own extremely extended eccentric family in North Carolina, where we have, oh, many, and my mother had five, four stepsisters and one half, no, four half sisters and one stepsister. And they all kind of married early and often. So there were a lot of relatives to keep up with who I was related to at any given time. Um, and so those really were a lot of the Laura Fleming series. And I did eight books and a bunch of stories in that series. With the next series, it was not quite as much me. It was a younger person. She wasn't married. Um, she was she was a, mass, a, a Bostonian instead of a Southerner. And so not as much me. With the third series, it's like, I mean, she, it's Georgia. Zachary is an academic, she, which I've never been, and I do the research and all, but I keep kind of going further and further from what I've, what I've done personally, and I think that's kind of been a, um, a thread throughout my books, and also I think the plotting, I hope the plotting is getting tighter, and I think there's more variety, so it's kind of evolved over time as to what I'm writing about. Well, when I started, as I said, I was I was, was a kid, um, and so one of the ways in which my writing has changed over the years, hopefully, is that it's gotten better uh, as I've I've gotten older and, and gotten more experience both at writing and also at living. Uh, but the other um, the other big difference that I see is that I'm writing a lot shorter now than I used to. Uh, when I was earlier in my short story writing career, a typical average story of mine would be somewhere probably in the neighborhood of four to 6,000 words. And nowadays, it's more like two to 4,000 words and 4,000 words is even a little bit long for me. And I, I, I'm not sure if that's a function of getting better or just of getting older and less able to coordinate all the strands of a, of a short story. Um, but I do see that, that they've definitely gotten smaller or shorter. In fact, I've, I've recently begun to write at a length that's called flash fiction which means a complete short story written and the number of words varies from place to place, but generally, most commonly, a thousand words. And I've done a, uh, quite a few of those over the last uh, couple of years. Um, the other thing I guess that's different for me, and I'm gonna go back to something that Lee said, talked about how at the beginning her first series was a character very much like herself. Um, I'm not really much in the way of a series writer. I have done a couple of series. Uh, my first, three short stories were all about a family uh, with a whole lot of kids named after famous fictional detectives. And the, the point of view character in those was Ellery Queen uh, Griffin. Um, the stories all appear in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And that character was very, very definitely the teenage me. I, I went back to that character a few years ago to celebrate the 50th anniversary of my first publication. And I wrote a, a, a fourth story in that series about young Ellery now grown up, and probably even nobody's surprised, young Ellery grown up is still me. He's a college teacher uh, uh, who, who, who does some writing on the side. Yeah, it's very interesting. Now, I want to ask you both if you have any specific uh, writing rituals or writing habits. So what is your writing process like? Is there anything unique to you in the way that you write? Is there any specific mood that you need to be in? Um, special setup? Should I take a turn going first, Lee? You go for it. Okay, I, I, I'm not a process writer. I know that there are people, and, and Lee, I don't know, you'll tell us. I don't know if you're one of those people who sits down every day from X o'clock to Y o'clock or sits down every day until you banged out X number of words. Uh, but that is definitely not me. I, I, I spend way more time not writing than I spend writing. If I have a process at all, I suppose the process is trying to figure out a way to avoid writing. I kind of write when I can't, can't avoid it. But, but the one thing that most of what I do does have in common is that I almost always begin my stories in an unusual way. I, most of the writers I've heard talk about process um, begin with a character, especially if they're doing a series, or they begin with a location, or they begin with a plot idea or a plot twist. Um, but I almost always begin with a title. I will see a phrase, uh, or I will hear a, a, a phrase, and, and actually it's gotten to the point now where my wife will turn to me and say, yeah, that's a story title for you. Uh, and once I have a title, then the, the, the rest is just kind of figuring out the story that would, would accompany that title. 
Uh, I'm do I'm working on one now. Uh, we were just in Savannah last weekend to celebrate my wife Lori's birthday, uh, and in the middle of Savannah, we got into a conversation with somebody uh, who referred to uh, a flight of stone steps that lead down from the Savannah waterfront up into the city proper as the stone steps of death. And Lori turned to me and said, Josh, that's your next story. And sure enough, I started writing it that day in our Airbnb room. Uh, but I, that's about as far as I can go in terms of process. Start with a title and then, you know, sooner or later, there'll be a story that attaches to it. That's interesting. So the title is your prompt and then you let it take you. Oh, almost always, very few exceptions. Wow, that's very interesting. Is it the same for you, Lee? Oh, gosh, no. Um, I have I have no process. Um, I tend to write in the wee hours of the morning. I don't know when it's quieter, where there's fewer interruption. And in fact, at one point I was writing, this was some years ago, but I was writing and I noticed some weird lights outside. It's like, what are those lights? And I realized it was dawn. I'd written through the night and hadn't even realized it because I started late, just kept on going. Um, I find it, I so I write at the night, I tend to go through a period of kind of I think Peter Elbow called it free writing or pre-writing or just kind of making notes about what I'm going to do. Once I get into a piece, I didn't have a word count goal per day and, and I'm pretty methodical, but getting me in is like, is really hard. And during the pandemic, when I thought, sure, I would write a lot because I've been, I'm home and I can't go anywhere and it's your distraction, but I, the stress level just has not been good for my writing. I've written very little during all of this. It's coming back again, which makes me happy. Mm -hmm. um, as far as where I start, I have started with, with the series, I tend to start with the characters, but also a new situation for the characters. Uh, with the, fa the, the Family Skeleton book I'm working on now is based on a summer camp that my daughter attended. Because a lot of the, the, the counselors who ran it were teachers during the year or, or college professors during the year. And then would do this during the summer. And it's, and it's a, a particular kind of camp is called LARP, live action role play where they kind of put on characters like a Dungeons and Dragons or a Lord of the Rings type characters and stay in persona for the camp. And then they're kind of creating their storyline as they go, very much interactive literature, which I thought was fascinating. And, and my daughters have done it. And I played a lot of D&D when I was younger. So I'm kind of using all that for the background. I have started with titles, um, a title from a, a short story I wrote called Sleeping with the Plush, which is a chapter title from a novel, from a, book, a nonfiction book on carnies I read. And I thought, and the, the title of the book was Eyeing the Flash. And I'm like, you had a title like Sleeping with the Plush and you didn't use it? Well, I'm going to use it, gosh darn it. And so I wrote a short story based on that. But then I've had other stories where I write the whole story and then have to come up with the title. It just, it just depends on the piece. So I don't have a very good process, I'm afraid. And I don't listen to music because I'm hard of hearing and music would be too distracting. So other than, other than writing into the wee hours, that's as much process as I got. And how did Sid come to you? That's so embarrassing. I don't remember. Um, okay. I, a friend, I was between series, which one series had ended and the next one hadn't been sold yet. It, it did end up selling, but in the interim, I was trying to come up with something new. Um, paranormal mysteries were doing very well. Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, maybe I'll do something paranormal. And I started, well, I don't want to do vampires because you know, one of my best friends is Charlene Harris, and she pretty much has that wrapped up. I'm not going not gonna to even go there. And I thought, well, werewolves, my friend Dana Cameron was doing werewolf stuff. Like, nope, not going there. And I started going through, it's like, yeah, Jim Butcher's doing wizards, and this person's doing witches, ghosts angels, all these different kinds of ghost cats, all these different kinds of characters. And it's like, what hasn't been done? And I thought, well, no one's done a skeleton. And I immediately heard what his voice was going to be like. And even though I reconfigured everyone else in the book, Sid the skeleton has been the exact same since he just popped into my head that, sure, no one's done a walking, talking skeleton. Yeah, there's a reason for that. It's weird. But it's been fun. So you took the road less taken. <laughs> Taken. And then he sat on the computer for 10 years until I actually got around to doing something and trying to sell him. Uh-huh. Oh, very interesting. I mean, Sid is such a wonderful character. Yeah. Now, I, I want to ask you, uh, again, the question is for both. Uh, are there any, uh, I mean, what, what do you think draws your readers towards your novels and short stories? 
mysteries in general, I think people like a clear cut ending. They like the guilty to be caught. If it's a harder end, it's going to be caught, but you know, the world's still dark afterwards. But in the traditional or cozy type, you know, you, you've, you've defeated, um, you defeated the chaos of the world by bringing law and order back. And I think that's very satisfying to people that you have an ending that, 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 and even, you know, sometimes the, the, the villain gets away, but he's been found out. And I think that's very satisfying for people. As far as the fantasy element, as we said, I think people like the idea of a little bit of magic, maybe not, you know, but, but not going as whole hog all the time as into a Hogwarts or a Harry Potter kind of world. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's been said probably a, a trillion times, uh, so I don't want to use the word escape, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's all that interesting for people to read about the life they're actually living. They're living that life. What's interesting is, is to read about a life that you're not living. And, and fortunately, still in 2021, most of us are not living terribly close to crime, and none of us are living in a world where skeletons walk and talk, and the hard Fourth School of Witchcraft and Wizardry exists. So fantasy certainly gives us a chance to get out of our everyday life. And even crime fiction gives us that opportunity. It gives us a chance to look at, at, at another world, the world in which evil things happen with some regularity uh, to people who don't deserve them. And, and hopefully the deed doers are, as Lee says at the end of the story, caught and, and pay for their crimes. Uh, although, of course, sometimes uh, in the real world, the evildoer doesn't get caught and doesn't pay for mm -hmm. her or his crime. And, and so that's also reflected in the world of crime fiction. So I'm not sure that to, to escape the real life is the right way to describe that. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that my life is one I need to escape from, but it's nice to take a vacation from it uh, by picking up a book and reading about things I don't see around me every day. So it's like exploring different worlds or discovering yeah. different layers of reality. It's like travel that you can do during the pandemic. Uh -huh. yeah. well, I, said, I think that, uh, especially with your with fantasy element, it gives you a chance to look at this world's problems at a, at a distance, at a perspective. Um, this is more TV than, than books, but in Star Trek, the original series, they would discuss all these things about sexism, about racism, and they would put a science fiction on, and you could see people going, well, this is all stupid, and you're watching, you're like, yeah, this is really stupid for a guy who's white on one side and black on the other to be different from someone who's black and white. I mean, it's a very heavy-handed anti-racism episode. But by putting it at distance, it almost brings it home in a way. It allows you to discuss things you couldn't discuss in real life. So I think that's sometimes where the fantasy stuff comes in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a safe space to discuss those issues that maybe you're not comfortable discussing in real life. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm sorry that, that Jasper hasn't, hasn't gotten here yet, and I certainly hope that he will get here. I'm looking forward to getting a chance to, to meet him and, and, and talk with him and listen to him. But this particular rule is a question where I'd love to hear uh, his answer. Because where, where my fiction is set almost 100% in the world we do live in, it's just parts of it we don't normally see. And where Lee's fiction is mostly set in the world we live in, except for the fact that there's this skeleton who can walk and talk. Uh, I can walk and talk. I just happened to be wearing clothes and stuff over it right now. <laughs> well, that's true. Good point. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's right. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. But of course, Jasper's fiction um, in, in his various different series, the Thursday Next series, the, the Nursery Crime series, the Dragon Slayer series, and now one book in the, the Shake of Grey series, those books, those series are all set in worlds that are very, very far divorced from the world that, that we live in. And I would love to have to have the opportunity to hear how he would respond to that question. Well, I mean, uh, and this is just to, to follow with the previous issue of Indelible, which was about escapism, which was about, you know, we had a few um, contributions from authors of, of fantasy and science fiction as well. And they pretty much say the same. So it's like, looking at our world, but from a distance, and at the same time, looking at parallel worlds, you know, the element of, of as you said, Josh, before, of taking a vacation, um, not to a place where, you know, not, not for having peace, but, you know, just a vacation, sort of like explore what it would be like living or being in different dimensions. 
So it's very interesting. And we know that people are drawn towards fantasy and fiction and, and mysteries ever since, you know, ever since they're very young. Um, and now I want to ask if you had any specific favorite authors or books or even movies that sparked this interest in you or that still influence the way you write? Any um, source of inspiration coming from books, movies, authors? All of them. I mean, after a while, it all kind of, it's all grist for the mill and that you're, you're, everything you see kind of influences or read it influences what you're working on. Uh -huh. Early on, um, I was trying to write science fiction. I just was really bad at it. But the authors I, for, my big inspirations were Robert Heinlein, because mm -hmm. he got me into science fiction in general. Um, and I thought that Andre Norton, who's not much, as much heard of these days, but she uh, wrote the kinds of things that I wanted to write. But it was reading Isaac Asimov, and he did a couple, a series of anthologies called the Early Asimov, and uh, excuse me, single author collections, not anthologies, in which for each story he would tell his process of how he learned to write the story, and the first story of the book was really not very good. He was very honest about that. This was the first story he'd written. It went through this process and this process to get published, and he kind of worked out how to create a writing career, and I found that. Oh, so that's how it works. You don't have to write your first story and be as good as a Heinlein or, or a Norton. You go, you can be, you can be a newbie and kind of build yourself up. And I found that very inspirational, just kind of the process. I mean, his process in terms of getting published, that's all changed these days. But the learning and improving a craft piece at a time, like this story was, had a great idea, but this story had a great idea and it had better characters. And this one had a good idea and the better characters and better pacing and how he kept learning different parts of his craft and that he didn't have to start out as a genius that he could just kind of work his way up was very inspirational for me. Because I could be a bad science fiction writer, I just couldn't be a good one. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with Lee that everything is grist for the mill. Um, but if I, if, I, if I had to point to a couple of uh, writers from whom I learned things that have had real value uh, for me, I, I would point to Ray Bradbury, uh, who showed me that prose can be poetry. Uh, and I would point to Ed McBain, uh, who, who showed me how to do dialogue and that dialogue is, is vitally important to fiction. Uh, and then I would also point to nonfiction writer Paul Theroux. He's also done some some, some fiction, but primarily um, nonfiction, who showed me uh, uh, how important a sense of place can be to a work of fiction. And that um, once I've got my title and I start thinking about the story that would fit in, really, I think probably the next thing that I think about is location, location, location. Where where is a story with this title going to happen? And I probably spend more time uh, researching locations than I spend researching anything else. I want my locations to be as close to real places as possible. So those three, uh, Bradbury, McBain, and Theroux have had noticeable influence on my own work. How about Terry Pratchett? You know, I mean, you could name you could name a thousand writers who I think Lee and I know I would would nod our heads and say, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is getting back once again to that grist for the mill concept. Yeah. Everything, everything. If if you don't take anything away from it, you might as well not have read it. Really, even if what you take away from it is, hey, don't do that. Even in a funny thing, even authors that I haven't read could be an influence by the way they run the careers or the way they approach writing. Mm science fiction author and I cannot remember his name and I never could get through um Gene Wolf Gene Wolf and I his book just never spoke to me whatsoever but I heard him speak several times about how he feels about writing and what he tries to put in his writing and that all inspired me as a writer even though his work didn't work for me I also see writers um whose kind of careers I like I mean and I don't mean just in terms of success but in terms of bravery um, Barbara Paul is a science fiction, as a science fiction and mystery writer, and I think most of her stuff is out of print these days, except for her one Star Trek tie-in novel. Uh, but she was a wonderful mystery writer, and I don't think she hit it big because she never did. She didn't follow the the usual path, you know, which was you know to start a series, which is more popular in, in mystery novels. 
she just, you know, she would do, went her own way and she did these wonderful books and she didn't hit it big, but the books were great. Um, Charlene Harris is another very brave writer because, you know, she could have kept writing the Sookie Stackhouse slash True Blood series for years. They wanted, they were throwing money at her. And she's like, no, I've, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to do something else. And, you know, if, if the, the next books didn't sell as well, she didn't care. She was doing something new and she enjoyed it. And they were still good. Mm -hmm. I admire that kind of, yeah, forget this. I'll just do what I want. <laughs> exactly. I mean, as you also mentioned before, as Josh mentioned, you know, you sort of have like a prompt and then you let it take you wherever it takes you. You're doing what you want um, without sort of the end in mind. So it's um, kind of like a journey, right? Would you describe it as such? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, how much truth is there in fiction? In the type of fiction that you write? Well, as I, as I said a minute ago, um, there's a lot of, of geographic truth uh -huh. uh, in the writing that I do. I, I, I am very careful to, to, in fact, thank goodness for Google Earth. Google Earth has been such a godsend to me, especially right. Street View. I actually called my wife into my office last night. I'm working on a, another story, not the Stone Steps of Death, but another one that's set at an elementary school. And on Google, Google Street View, I found a, a beautiful photograph of the front of an elementary school. And I had to call my wife and she's a master naturalist in Fairfax County, Virginia. And I said, what kind of trees are those? So I could get the trees right uh, in the story. I mean, you know, everything that, uh, the stories that I write are made up, but I hope that the people are believable. I hope that, that, that when you read something of mine, you find yourself thinking, yeah, I can believe that these are actual people or that these at least could be actual people. So to the geographic extent and to the personality extent, I, I think and hope uh, that there's truth in what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. I think there's, I mean, I think I can probably put more fiction than I could put my, in, in nonfiction. Um, the Sid books, despite the, the, the skeleton and the, the bone jokes, of, of which there are plenty, trust me, they're about friendship and they're about family and they're about found family. And I think there's a lot of truth in that with my Laura Fleming series, which were the first books I wrote, the one set in North Carolina. It was about finding your place in the family and also appreciating a place you're from even when you no longer live there. I did not write books set in North Carolina until I moved to Massachusetts because I could get the perspective to see what was good, what I liked, and what was not obvious to everyone. When you live in the same, for me at least, when I lived in the same place for all that year, I didn't know what I, I didn't know what was special about it. I mean, everyone I knew knew the same kinds of things. I had to get away from it and say, oh, these people don't know what a fish camp is. And they don't use the word y'all every day. And they don't, you know, all these, these silly, you know, they're not part Cherokee. I mean, everyone I knew was probably part Cherokee, big deal. And you come in here, it's like, yes, I'm part Cherokee. Oh, wow, First Nation. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. That was just my great, great grandmother. I don't know. Um, and all those, you know, so that, that those series are really much, very much about making my peace with North Carolina, having left it. Um, the Tilda books, Tilda was kind of, which was a series set in Boston. It was about a person who wrote, where are they now stories, stories about people who used to be famous. And then some of them get murdered. She gets to solve the mysteries. It's great fun. But I was kind of talking about nerd culture. Um, the, the same kind of stuff you see on Big Bang Theory with the, mm -hmm. you know, lots of science fiction, lots of comic books, lots of just people who remember all the episodes of the Brady Bunch. And it was going to kind of come playing with that. So, and why people find those comforting. So I think there's a lot of truth in my fiction, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm going to leave out the murders or the bone jokes. There's room for both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love a good bone joke. Absolutely. Well, I mean, both of you mentioned the importance of location. Have you ever written, um, I don't want to use the term in real time, but at a specific location. Um, so have you written about a specific location while you were in it at the same time? So for example, you're on holiday and then the setting kind of inspires a, a story or a novel. Have you actually sat there and, and written and copied and drank in everything around you and wrote it down? Or is it usually after? Do you let the dust settle first and then kind of start writing? Well, for me, it's usually after the dusk has settled, but the mm -hmm. big, I guess, exception to that would be um, 
in the 1980s, I spent 10 years, 11 years, um, 80s and early 90s living overseas, uh -huh. uh, teaching on American military bases for the University of Maryland's then European division. Now it has a different name. Mm -hmm. And at one point, uh, they sent me uh, to the island emirate of Bahrain, not too terribly far removed from where you are right now, uh, and uh, plot me down there for a year. Now, Bahrain is tiny. It's uh, an island emirate, uh, and the main island, which is where almost everybody lives, is only five miles wide and only 10 miles from top to bottom, and uh, the bottom half of the country is a Bahraini military territory. So the actual size of the inhabited country is 25 square miles. There's not a lot to do there. So I thought, well, let me write a short story set here in Bahrain, and I did, um, and, and um, wound up, even after I left Bahrain writing more of them, it's the longest series that I've ever done. It's not very long, I usually don't write series, but there are 10 stories in the series. Uh, I wrote the first three of them while I was there in Bahrain, and then seven more after I left the country. I've written in area while living here. I mean, I, I set some of the story of the where the now series was set in Malden, Massachusetts, which is where I live. But mostly, it's from I need the distance, and it it wouldn't necessarily. I would set things at apartments I used to live in. I have to. I need the perspective for my stuff, I guess. And what, was, what gives you the, the, the vibes, like the mystery writing vibes in a, in a location? What are some of the things that actually spark a story? Mystery writing is easy. I mean, it, all you have to do is have some reason to want to kill someone. And if you've written in bad enough traffic, you go to a family reunion, you know, academia, there's always some reason. I mean, it's, it's exaggerated. In real life, you would probably just you know, make a rude gesture or, or cuss at them or something. But in mystery, just take it a little bit further and go ahead and kill them. It's more sense. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm a <laughs> I, I, would, I would second that, uh, but I would also add that, um, at least for me, because I'm doing short stories, if you're gonna write a mystery novel, it's gotta have murder in it, pretty much. Uh -huh. uh, but short stories at that length, it, there is no requirement that there be a murder. There has to be some kind of a crime, but it doesn't have to be murder. And I would say that a lot of what I do um, doesn't involve murder and very, very little of what I do involves on stage murder. Usually the murder happens either before the events of the story begin or off stage during the events of the story. But I'm, I'm, I'm always looking as I travel, Lori and I, we do a lot of traveling, at least we did before, before COVID and will again after it, I hope, or, or after it becomes less severe. Uh, and I'm, I'm just always kind of looking for what bad thing, not necessarily a murder, could happen here. Uh, and, and then that bad thing it, it turns into meat for a story. Mm -hmm. Were you ever inspired by any real murder stories, like things you see on TV or that you hear on the news? Oh, I'm, I'm working on the, the, the elementary school story that I'm working on now uh -huh. is inspired by something real. Okay. Um, there's, there's a group uh, uh, online uh, and offline called the Short Mystery Fiction Society. You mentioned them when you were introducing me. They're the ones who gave me their Golden mm -hmm. Aaron Award for Lifetime Achievement last year. Uh, and I am a regular reader of their listserv. Um, and uh, somebody recently made a kind of a, a derogatory comment about the Billy Joel anthology that I just had come out last month saying, you know, Billy Joel's not really a musician, so why in the world would you do a whole book devoted to him? And I made a joke on the listserv. I said, well, okay, fine. You know, I, I, I promise you I will not do crime stories inspired by one-hit wonders. Well, the next thing you know, a publisher, the, the publisher who did the Billy Joel anthology, decided he's going to do that book. He's going to do a book of crime fiction inspired by one-hit wonders, and he invited me to submit to Mm -hmm. So I picked a song that came out in 1979 by a band, uh, an Irish band, uh, called the Boomtown Rats. And I suspect that people who are here with us today know the song. It's called I Don't Like Mondays. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that song was inspired by events that happened six months before the song came out when a 16-year-old girl, Brenda Spencer, wounded eight school children, killed the principal, and a custodian and also wounded a police officer outside of Grover Cleveland Elementary School in San Diego, California. 
Now, why do I have all those details at my fingertips right now? Because the story that I'm writing is set at a different Grover Cleveland Elementary School, this one in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, on the 39th anniversary of Brenda Spencer's shooting spree. Um, and uh, uh, so th th this story got its origins in a song which got its origins in a real world event. Mm -hmm. I have a short story called uh, Lying in the Road Death. And this was one of the rarities where, where I did start with the, sh with the title. In North, my husband found this fact in a book. I don't remember what he was reading, a book about North Carolina, a book of strange crimes or something. Um, that in North Carolina, there's an issue called laying, Lying in the Road Death where what happens is, um, if it's hot during the during the, uh, the daytime, the black top of the roads, that's our phone, um, and the black tops gets very warm and then it cools off in the evening. Well, people who were drunk would be walking home and they'd get tired and, the, they, and they'd be cold. So they're, oh, but the, the, the road's nice and warm. So they lay down on it and get warmed up, fall asleep and get run over by a car or a truck. And, and this happens with such regularity that the medical examiner would say, ah, oh, yes, we have another lying in the road death. Mm -hmm. And so I use that as the basis for a short story. Mm -hmm. The idea of someone who was lying in the road or, or was it murder? Did they make him lie down at all? I'm just <laughs> playing the word. Because I just thought that was such a funky little title. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my, let's see which books. Are, I used the syndrome that, um, in the last of the Tilda Harper series, The Last from the Past. I um, wrote about people, there's a case of, you know, you, Wizard of Oz had the guys who were the munchkins, and uh, a bunch of the munchkins would then tour, going to collectible shows and, and all kinds of events as being, you know, the mayor of Munchkin, meet the mayor of Munchkin land, meet the coroner of Munchkin land. Well, there were people who would go around being the mayor of Munchkin land who were not, in fact, the mayor of Munchkin land. Some of them had not even been in the movie these people pretending to be someone famous and not big famous not pretending to be Billy Joel but pretending to be somebody really obscure it's like really I just I just found that fascinating so I use that as a plot point someone who's pretending to be a really obscure famous famous person in oh. order to make themselves happy which, which book was this again or which story was this I want to read this one. Oh, this was Blast from the Past which Blast was one of the Tilda Harper series. Yeah, when you look at your characters, um, how real are they to you? So do you, are they real to the extent that, you know, they, they actually exist for you or are they real only when you, you know, when you talk about them or when they pop into your head? I mean, what's the level of reality? Um, I've asked, other science fiction authors before and um, their answer was they are very real. So do you feel the same way when you're writing mystery and crime fiction? I well, well everything I see Sid now. So yeah, I guess they're pretty real. It's like, oh look, there's a Sid, there's a big Sid, there's a little Sid. <laughs> yeah. I think if you create them well enough as they're well enough to you that you they're real enough that I can say, oh, you know, Georgia would never do that. Or, yeah, I can see Tilda doing that. But, you know, yeah, they're pretty real. Mm -hmm. They're realer than my relatives and much more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have something to say about that. But before I do, I just spotted that Glenda put in the chat that uh, correctly that the Boomtown Rats were not one hit wonders in Ireland and the UK. And that is correct. Uh, and I, in fact, I mentioned that to the editor of the One Hit Wonders book and said, yeah, they were One Hit Wonders in America, but not elsewhere. Is that okay? And he said, yes. So, Glenda, you are correct, but apparently it was okay for this book anyway. Um, well, as far as realness of characters goes, I have to tell you, uh, going back to that Bahrain series that I wrote, um, I, uh, 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 when I came up with my idea for the first of the Bahrain stories, I wanted to use a police officer. And in Bahrain at that time, the entire police force was Pakistani uh, because you couldn't have a, a Sunni police force because they would pick on the Shias and you couldn't have a Shiite police force because they would pick on the Sunnis and you couldn't put them together because they would pick on each other. So the entire Bahraini police force was imported from Pakistan. And they had a barracks, a police barracks, uh, right next door to where I was living. So I walked up uh, next door to the police barracks and were a bunch of these guys sitting in a circle outside on the ground, 
enjoying some time off. And I asked them if I could join them and they welcomed me. And I said, I'm an American, I'm, I'm writing short stories set here. I, I wanna use a police officer. Can you tell me if I was gonna write about a Bahraini police officer, what would his name be? And somebody immediately yelled out a name. And I said, and, and is he married? And somebody immediately yelled out, yes. And I said, where in Pakistan is he from? And somebody immediately yelled out an answer. And this went back and forth probably for 30 questions and answers until I finally realized that they weren't just making stuff up. They were telling me their own truths about their name and their marital status and where in Pakistan they came from. Mm -hmm. And the character I wound up creating, Mahbub Chaudhry, who I used in, in a total of 10 stories, is an amalgam of, of, of those police officers uh, from that one day in Bahrain. And as a result, he's, he's very real to me. Uh, he's, he's, he's the one character I've created who I think, yeah, this is, this is as close as I'm ever gonna come to a living, breathing human being. Hmm. So if, do you feel that there is a, a character that you've made up, which you would like to meet in real life? Like, well, my book. Okay. Oh, I would, I would, I would fly to Bahrain or fly to Pakistan if, if, if he actually was real and I could uh -huh. see him. Because I'm sure that this guy, I wrote 10 stories. I'm sure this guy has more stories to tell and I, I'd love to hear about them so I could write them too. My wife has been nagging me to bring Mahmoud back and, and <laughs> I just read the story to him. Yeah, you probably will at some point. And D, would it be Sid or is it someone else? Or Georgia, or actually, there's a side character in the Sid books called um, Charles, and he's a very dapper, very polite uh, academic. He teaches in, in history, and uh, especially the um, gosh, what does special the in, in British history? And I just thought he would be kind of fun to be and have to hang out with because he's just so polite and charming. And he's not a huge part of the books, but him I like. I always worry that my main characters might like me, not like me, and that would be embarrassing. Because you know they have all these interesting life-solving mysteries, and I just sit at home and write. How much interesting? How much? What would they have to talk to me about? But with Charles, he's so charming, he would put up with me being boring. Mm -hmm. So he's probably my, my number one pick. Well, do you do you talk to your characters? Is there any form of active imagination that you do? Do they? I do you just watch them be and become and, and have their conversations or do you feel like you tailor it? I know Josh said that the title takes them. So there's probably a little bit of, you know, um, sitting back and watching things unfold. Does that also work for you, Lee? It, it seems to, it's a kind of a mix. Once the characters established enough, I can certainly say, no, this doesn't make sense. The character would do this, the character would do that. But I have to get to a different point, get them to the point where I can write about them as a main character, not so much as, you know, with a small side of character. Right. But for protagonists, I have to be able to kind of hear their voice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, I'll write, and I'll, you know, with Georgia, for instance, she started out single, working as a grad, as a grad student, and then she became older, and then she became younger, and then I gave her a kid, and all these different things. I kept trying until I could hear her voice consistently in my head. Uh -huh. Children was the way I went through so many different iterations of what her name was going to be, what she was going to be like. When I felt like I could hear, the, hear her describing things, that's when I could write about her. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you know, everything I do from that point has to be consistent. So if, if, if so, it's, um, you know, they, 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 I won't say they take over, but I can certainly tell when I've gone off track. Because, you know, once you build a house, you can't suddenly have a window there that wasn't there before. And it's the same with the character. Once you built a character, you kind of know what path it's going to go on. Right. That's very interesting. You yeah. know, when, when I translate, I, I really feel like the most important part of the job is to get out of the way. Uh, what, I, what I, as a translator, am is I'm a conduit from the original author to the ultimate reader. And my job is, is just to, if this person knew how to write effectively in English, what would they have written? That's the job of being a translator. And I feel kind of similarly about being a writer. You know, if, if these people were real, if these events were real, what would they say? What would they do? And, and, and I, I, I kind of feel like, no, they don't talk to me. 
But my job is to get out of their way and let them talk directly to the reader. Mm -hmm. right. um, I have a question about your future projects, uh, which you may have started or you may um, be thinking of starting. I mean, now we're in the pandemic. Do you think of writing anything, um, any post-COVID story, like that happens in a post-COVID world? Um, with post-COVID things happening, whatever they are, like the new normal as a setting. Do you have anything like that in mind at the moment? The book I'm working on, which is gonna be uh, another family skeleton book, and I mentioned it said that this, this LARP camp, and, um, and probably it's no surprise to anyone, the people who tend to go to these LARP camps are often a little bit of nerds. They're not, they're not the jocks, they're not the popular kids. They're the, the outcasts which means that a LARP camp is extremely important to them. It's the one time of the year where they can be with their tribe and feel comfortable and feel cool. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of those kids after a year having missed it for a year. And part of the issue is um, if there's a murder at this camp, and you would think, well, they're gonna close the camp. There's a murder. They're not gonna leave these kids around, but I can see George's entree to the, the, the um, song solving the crime and sense as well is the fact that these kids have been away from the people they feel the most safe with for a year and a half and they're not going to interrupt it if they can solve the crime and make sh and keep the camp going that's kind of their goal to keep the investigation because when you're ever writing about a non-professional mystery solver getting them involved in the mystery is sometimes the trickiest part because most people if they encounter a dead body do not then go well I should now solve this mystery and forget about the cops Okay, once in a while. <laughs> um, so the same thing with, with Georgia, she's got to have a reason to solve every crime and she instead has to have a reason for getting involved. So the reason for getting involved is these, so these poor kids will not have to be sent home from their one happiest moment of every year. And when you're, you know, 13 or 14, a year and a half, two years is a long time to be without mm -hmm. your friends. Uh -huh. So yeah, definitely play, I mean, it's definitely going to be playing a part. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, the, uh, the play will be over or at least people will be vaccinated and so forth. But it's not going to, but it's definitely going to play a role. Mm -hmm. well, I've never written anything set during COVID time. I, I, one of the stories I'm working on now does in fact refer back to COVID time. Mm -hmm. So the story is clearly written after things have returned as close as they're ever going to get mm -hmm. to normal. Uh, I, I, I know that, and I don't know exactly where I, I I saw this or heard this, but the editor of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, Janet Hutchins, um, has said that she really hopes that she won't be deluged with a whole lot of COVID-19 stories. <laughs> and I think part of that is, is, is referring back to something that we talked about earlier, the idea that reading genre fiction is, is for some people an escape and for some people a vacation. Uh, mm -hmm. And whether you're escaping reality or taking a vacation from reality, this reality has just been so horrifying. Uh, so much death, so much loss of income, so much illness um, that, that we've had to deal with all day, every day for 15 months now. Um, why in the world would anybody want to pick up a book or a short story and read more about what they've been living every single day? So I, I, I just, I don't see myself doing anything that in which COVID is more than just a reference and probably a reference to the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of approaches. I, I think like when the uh, things first got started, there were people who had books coming out with a plague reference or maybe even yeah. some kind of plague. Mm -hmm. um, and at the beginning, they sold well because people, oh yeah, let's read about this. Stuff. Okay, it's bad, but hey, at least we don't have zombies marching down the street. Mm -hmm. But the further it went, the more people was like, yeah, I can't read this anymore. And I'm on the list with a couple of people, a bunch of people who write um, uh, traditional slash cozy mysteries. And most of them are saying, yeah, we're never, COVID's never happening in our world. We're just not even going to mention it. And so I think it's going to be different. But I think maybe in 10, 15 years, we'll see those COVID stories set during COVID times. And by then, you know, God willing, there isn't another plague going on that people will be willing to read those stories. But yeah, for now, I think Janet's right. No one's going to want to read those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe later, as you say, um, could be different in 10, 15 years. It's like when we read stories set in World War II or whatever, so this might be like a World War III genre or something. We don't know. I mean, we hope not. Um, but anyway, 
Um, so, Lee and Josh, how much research do you conduct before writing your novels or short stories? Do you do a lot of research? Or is it like a, you know, a thing as you go? Do you research as you go, depending on how much you need to find out? Well, I don't, I don't write historicals. Um, uh -huh. and, and so I don't have to do much in the way of historical research. I mentioned earlier that I do a lot of geographical right. uh, research. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think I probably do more research when I'm translating than I do when I'm, uh, when I'm writing. You know, I'll translate a story by an author who refers to, oh, I don't know, a song that was on the radio in 1984. Well, I have to look that up to make sure that, that song really was on the radio uh -huh. in 1984. And if it wasn't, we either have to change the year or we have to change the song or it's going to be published incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, I think I do a lot more research for as a translator than I do as a writer, setting aside the geography. How about researching chemicals and, and forensics and stuff? Do you do that? Oh, guns. Guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're going to write about guns, you uh -huh. have to get every single detail right. Mm -hmm. Because you know, as, as a writer, now it's probably different for novelists. I hope it's different for novelists. Short story writers don't get mail. Mm -hmm. If we do, I would say probably 99 out of 100 pieces of mail are going to be some gun person somewhere saying you made a mistake when you wrote about that gun in your story. And so I, I, I do. I, first of all, I don't put a lot of guns in my stories. But if I put a gun in a story, I research the hell out of that gun because I don't want those 99 letters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of cheat on my research because I write about things I, I know about already. For, for instance, I like I like reading about the golden age of piracy. So I had read a fair amount about the golden age of piracy. So when I set, got an idea for a short story, um, which is your basic courtroom drama set aboard a pirate ship, because that makes total sense. I started, you know, then I would do more in-depth research to go, okay, what would they have named the ship? Um, because, you know, they, their styles and what they, and I had actually got a friend of mine who's an archaeologist of the right period. So, now that they would no one would name a ship that. How about this instead? Um, and kind of those little details of research. But I knew a lot kind of the feel already. And it's actually sometimes you get great stuff when you're doing research that you didn't expect to find. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing this short story and it was going to be set aboard a pirate ship. And it was being written for an anthology of legal courtroom dramas, which I did end up sending to because once again, I wrote the story too long. So I had to tell it once I felt like I keep doing that. Um, I can't, writing a, a slash fiction, just, I can't do it. I just can't even introduce the character that fast. Um, so I'm writing the story and I wrote it. And the idea was that um, when a pirate signed onto a ship, a golden age of piracy, they would sign the ship articles, which were the rules they had to live by, which would just, you know, how the money would be divided up. Um, and, you know, what, what the rules are, who you could do, what you could do. And, you know, you weren't allowed to kill your crew members. You would think they're pirates, they're murderers. Yes, you can murder other people. You can't murder your crew members. Huh. I thought, well, if someone gets murdered, then the, they, they've got the articles, you broke the rules. They must have some kind of a, a court or trial. So I thought I'd do something with that. And so I started researching it and I found out that real life pirates as a hobby would reenact admiralty courts. Because if they, if they, you know, they were uh, stuck somewhere and they didn't have anyone to rob that day. They would, you know, they would put on a fake court because they figured they would all end up in admiralty court at some point or another for their piracy sins. And that they practiced in one day, okay, you get to be the prosecutor and you get to be the judge and you get to be the executioner. Everyone wanted to be the executioner, I think. Um, and they would fake this out so, enough so that they knew more about um, the, the free court procedures than many lawyers. And it's oh. like, this was like gold and I used this in the short story because they could put on a trial because they actually did do that. Um, I admit I only found this in one book, which was the erudite uh, tome, the dummy's guide to pirates, but I'm going to say it's true and I'm going to use it. So sometimes you find these great things, you know, I was researching pirates in general, but I found this great fact that I could use, but I had read about pirates for years. I've read, the, I've written, said about circuses because I like circuses and I'd read a bunch about it. Um, so I, I cheat by writing about things I, I'm already interested in and then just doing the detailed research, the, the, the small picture after I've got the big picture. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't do a whole bunch of um, forensics research either. I don't even do guns because I generally I'll just hit somebody instead because it's easier. Yeah. Um, okay. It's just not what I'm doing in the books I'm writing. I, I, I like a book that for those details well, but I don't have that much interest in doing the work myself. That's a lot like work. Right. right. Oh, very interesting hearing you talk about, you know, this experience and, and the way you do it, what works for you, what doesn't. Are there any challenges involved? So what's, what's the hardest part about your type of writing? about writing mystery fiction and murder crimes, um, uh, murder crime mysteries. So what is it? Both Lee and Josh, is there anything that you feel is, um, is challenging or is it not? Finding a new motive. Okay. It's, it's something, um, if the motive has been done 3,000 times, it's too easy to solve the mystery and that's just no fun. Uh -huh. And so trying to find a different motive is always challenging. Um, finding a way to make, as, as, as anyone who's read on, on police, uh, real police officers knows a lot of what they do is really boring stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes weeks to get tests back. They have to question 3,000 people, most of whom know nothing. And it's a way to kind of fill in that space of what you have to do to get there and still make it interesting. These days, so much is done on computers and there's a limit how interesting it is to say, and then I tapped a whole long time and then I hit Google. And so trying to make that interesting and still keep moving, that's a bit of a challenge these days. Uh, I guess for me, the hardest challenge, I can't remember who said this, but somebody once said that writing is easy. All you have to do is get your butt in a chair and open a vein. Uh, and I think the hardest part for me is probably just getting my butt in the chair. I said earlier, I'm just, you know, I'm not a professional writer. I am an avocational writer, not a vocational writer. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm a, I'm, I didn't hear you. Lee. Say it again. You get paid for it, but you are by definition professional, Josh. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm professional because I get paid for it, but it's not, it's, it, I mean, it's beer money you know, for me, uh, uh, short story writers do not make a great deal of money. Um, no, most novelists don't either, unless you're like Lee is a, a, one of the more successful ones. Uh, but if, 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 if it was a question of, of doing this in order to make money, well, I would never do it. Um, but uh, I do it because uh, it's, it, I think Dorothy Parker when said, I hate writing, but I love having written something. And I feel I feel that way. I mean, the writing part is agonizing for me, but the the being able to pick up uh, you know a, a book uh, that has my name on it uh, that part is is thrilling. So uh, it's just the getting the butt in the chair part that is my biggest challenge. I have a hard time keeping the most common writing challenge, actually sitting there and getting some writing done. I mean. From my personal experience, I, I, I don't write novels, but I do write short stories and I do write poems and I do some academic writing as well. And um, yeah, it's actually, I, I, I oftentimes find myself stealing a minute here, a minute there, you know, so like a stretch of 30 minutes, that would be something. So it, it's, it's just tough to get it out of you. You feel like sometimes you kind of you need to squeeze it out and there's just not enough time. So, and, and Lee said she writes late at night. Sometimes that's the only time when we can write. And you ever heard of Jane Austen's writing methods? You know, Jane Austen wrote these intricate novels of character, but she was running a, a household, which was, uh -huh. you know, a lot more work than it is now, let me tell you. Uh -huh. She would have had, had a blank book sitting on like a sideboard and she'd be running around cleaning and cooking. She'd go, oh, here's a great sentence. And she'd write it out and then she'd run off again. I can't imagine being able to, that's, I do that on my phone, on the notebook section. So I'm like, you know, hey, there's a sentence here. Let me jot it down before it goes away. And, and once uh, somebody gave us a really, really good piece of advice. And it's keep a marker in the shower because that's where you get your best ideas. Write them down on the wall. <laughs> I haven't so done the marker thing yet, but definitely <laughs> the shower is my, my writing place. Oh, yeah. yeah and, then, and then the moment it's over, the ideas, you know, they just fly away. So. I don't know, maybe the, the shower thing is kind of a, a good idea after all. So, and this brings us to our last question before the Q&A session. Um, what are you reading right now? Are you reading anything right now? If not, what was the most recent thing that you've read? 
I'm one of those people who I have a different book in each room of the house. Uh, and so depending on what room I'm in, that will determine what I'm reading. Uh, right now in the living room, I'm reading a, a book of radio scripts from John Dixon Carr's B-13 radio series from I think the 30s and the 40s. It was the collection of, of scripts was published by Crippen and Landrew. They do a lot of, of golden age uh, compilation stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in the bedroom, I'm working my way through C.S. Lewis's Space mm -hmm. Trilogy. Uh, I've read um, Out of the Silent Planet uh, and uh, um, uh, Paralandra, the first two, and I'm, I'm now a couple chapters into That Hideous Strength, the last one. Uh, uh, out on the back deck, I'm reading the current issue of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it depends on where I am while I'm reading. On my phone, I'm usually reading uh, various different things that I get from uh, uh, the Black Cat Mystery and Science Fiction Book Club, which is a great way to get uh, lots and lots and lots of interesting old stuff at a very competitive price point. Lee, how about you? What are you reading? I've been reading uh, Donald Westlake, who wrote, mm -hmm. you're talking about books that don't, mysteries that don't include a murder. Donald Westlake did the, the comic uh, paper books, the Dortmunder books. And I've kind of been working on and off on the idea of a, of a caper novel. And because I just like reading them and like watching them particularly. So I've been reading his to kind of say, because I, I, I got a few chapters in. It's like, this isn't quite working. So I've been reading the Dortmunder books, which I'd read some of in the past. Um, the one I just read, which is such an audacious book, it's called Jimmy the Kid. And it's, um, he... John Wesley had two names, writing names. Why would anyone have two writing names? What a, what a pain. But anyway, he, <laughs> and, um, he wrote as Richard Stark, and they were much darker, grimmer books. And he wrote a book called Child Heist, which was about kidnapping a child. And which and in Dortmunder books, one of the guys reads this book and goes, you know, we could do this. And it's basically the same plot, which is really a remake of um, a rewrite of uh, The Ransom of Red Chief by O. Henry which is you kidnap someone and the kids that you're paying to have kidnapped, you want to give them back. Um, but he did it, you know, Stark did it in a dark, gritty way, and Dortmunder did the exact same plot in a hilarious way, and which was really audacious to steal from yourself and to do it totally differently. And, and you just kind of how to put a, put a heist together. And also, they're just fun to read. So I'm probably going to work on some more Dortmunder. I just finished Jimmy the Kid last night, so I'll probably start on a new Dortmunder today. He was great in both of his uh, identities, both Westlake and Stark. As, as different as night and day, you would never guess that yeah. the, the Dortmunder books and the Hitman books were written by the same person. There's some authors who do that. Lawrence Block is another one. He writes the Matt Scudder books that are very dark, but then he writes the Bernie Rodenbar books, which are much lighter. And they're all good. Oh, sounds like some fun reading. Um, I just received an email from um, Jasper Ford. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it with us today, but um, he will be with us in a future session. So um, hopefully we will get to, to see him again in another indelible evening like this one. Uh, we have a lot of comments in the chat box, a lot of comments, and so many questions as well. Um, I'm looking through the questions. Some of them were already answered through the course of the, um, the panel. So I will try asking the questions that haven't been answered yet. So um, there's a very interesting question by Malak Ergenzi, who is an EUD student. Um, speaking of characters, how do you choose the names of your characters? So is there any specific process maybe? She asks, what is your process for character development? How do you develop the traits of each character in your story? So we can start with the name. I mean, is it, do you choose the names at random or is it, is there irony in, in the way that you choose the names, like in the names themselves? It depends a lot. Sid was Sid the skeleton from the very first. I never considered a name, different name. Georgia went through a bunch of different iterations. Mm -hmm. um, with the, the, the first series I did, since it was based so much on my own family, I got old family trees and took names from it and mm -hmm. used like, fairly unusual, very Southern sounding names for those characters. The character's name is Laurie Ann, is my protagonist, who goes by Laura, but her family still calls her Laurie Ann. My name is Tony, but my family, some of my family still calls me Tony Lee. 
um, but you have to be related to be able to, to use that. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, kind, kind of playing games with names. I actually do play games with names in, I wrote a story set at a lingerie store and all the names were based on famous people who dealt with lingerie, like Frederick from Fredericks of Hollywood. There was a Victoria from Victoria's Secret. Mm -hmm. I dug up the name of the person who invented the brassiere and I put their name in. And no one's gonna notice this, but it, it made me snicker. In Lying in the Road Death, everybody was named after um, types of scotch because, and, and different kinds of alcohols, just because it was fun. So, you know, sometimes it's a name, and, and then sometimes it's like, I need a name for this character. I look on my bookshelf and go, yeah, John. John is good, and I do that. <laughs> I, I, I take names from all different places. I use names of people I know. I look in phone books. I use names of, of former students. Um, I think uh, uh, two things in, in particular, I mentioned my, my Bahraini uh, police officer, um, and the one name that didn't come from that circle of actual police officers is his first name. Uh, the character's first name is Mahboub, uh, and I found that in a listing somewhere of, of Pakistani male first names, uh, and the reason I picked it was because it had Boob in it, and how could I possibly not put Boob as a character name? It was un, un, irresistible to me. Um, and then I, just yesterday, as I was working on this I Don't Like Monday story, I, it struck me that I have never in 53 years of writing for publication named a character Josh. So I decided I would, for the first time, I would name a character Josh, although I, I, I've actually named him Joshua, which is not my name. My parents were too poor to afford the UA at the end. So I'm, I'm just Josh, not Joshua. But I did finally put a Joshua into one of my own stories. I think I've ever done a Tony, really, come to think of, but I think I would find that confusing. Although my daughter and a character in one of the books are both named for the same relative. So I have a, a, an Aunt Maggie in the books, and my daughter is Maggie as well. So I don't know if that confuses her or not, but it's, I'm sorry, it's too late now. She's stuck with it. Mm -hmm. One thing about names, which is kind of fun, is it at uh, conventions and writers events, people actually will have charity auctions. And you can actually sometimes buy a chance to have your name in a story or in a book. Mm -hmm. And people get such a kick out of that. And it's like, you know, so I've had people, and sometimes they'll give you a name that doesn't in any way fit with what you're saying, and you got to find a way to make it fit in. Um, Langervoort was one of the more unusual ones I had to fit in twice because she bought one for herself and then one for her daughter. And I'm like, okay, another Langervoort. There's tons of Langervoorts in my books now. Um, there's a couple of people who've done this for so many different uh, auctions that you see Maggie Mason in books, in lots and lots of mystery books, and people are going, why did everyone use this name? That's why, because Maggie liked buying these things and putting her name in books. Mm -hmm. Is it a name for the, the, the act of naming a character after somebody who you know? It's called Tuckerizing. Yeah, for William Tucker. Yeah. And I, I have been Tuckerized once. Uh, the legendary Edward D. Hoke, who uh, was just a master of, of the short story. In fact, it's Ed Hoke, after whom the Short Mystery Fiction Society's Golden Derringer Award is named. It's the Edward D. Hoke Memorial Golden Derringer Award. Ed Tuckerized me in a story once. He, he had a character named Josh, and he, he made sure I knew that it was named, the character was named after me. Uh, and he was the murder victim. Aww. I've been tuckerized once, and I actually said it's been tuckerized. Hmm. I guess people like the idea of a skeleton. Sid skeletons grown up in a couple of books now. One thing I found in doing my names recently is that I realized because I, you know, I'm white Anglo-Saxon and live in the south and the north, but I don't. I've been trying to pick out names that weren't also standard American names, because you know we're a country of immigrants. I should be using. I'm setting something in Massachusetts. There should be some Haitian names, some Portuguese names, some Haiti, uh, Vietnamese names, not just Irish and Italian. So mm -hmm. I've been working on that a lot more lately. Yeah, names are quite interesting in stories because we always wonder, as readers, where did that name come from? Like, could it mean something? Is there any hidden, I don't know, allusion to it? Well, yeah, name symbolism can be interesting. I did a story back in the 80s. Um, uh, the story is called Busman's Holiday. And for anybody who's not familiar with the expression, a busman's holiday is when 
you do with your downtime what you do with your uptime, with your professional time. So if the bus driver, for example, were to take a vacation on a Greyhound bus around the country, that would be a busman's holiday. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a story called Busman's Holiday in which the main character does uh, on his off time what he does professionally. Uh, and I named the character Busman. Uh, um, so this, the title works on several different levels. It is about a busman's holiday, but it's also about Mr. Busman's holiday. And, and as it turns out in the story, what Mr. Busman does professionally is he's a hitman. And on his vacation, he commits a murder for which he doesn't get paid just because he wants to. Can I ask something or comment? Go ahead. This is Dr. Omar Sabah. Also Hello. Hi, Lee. Hi, Josh. That was really, really interesting. Fascinating stuff. I yes. wanted to say, just mention, like, can I make a comment from my own reading and see what you say to it? Um, Lee, you mentioned something about bringing law and order to the world with, with fiction. And I think a common theme for both of you has been escapism or the, re the level of realism and so on. And um, I, I mean, I, I'm not a big genre reader, but, I, but I have, I'm more interested in, the, in the, 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 the concept of mystery and crime and how, um, you know, how implotted it is. It, it, it isn't, I mean, Ian Forster once wrote that a story is the king married the queen and then a, and a plot is the king married the queen because she's beautiful, right? And so I think mystery and crime stories tend to be more like the second type. There's always a closing rationale or kind of solution, right? And um, I'm actually very interested in G.K. Chesterton. I don't know if you guys uh, read or know of him. Um, you know, he's a great writer in, in his mystery stories, but not Father great Brown. in his novel. Oh, sorry? Father, Father Brown. Brown, yes, exactly, yeah. And what I find about Chesterton, because I'm, I'm a bit of an aficionado, and I found it common with a lot of writers slash readers of mystery and crime, is that they have a very rationalistic or mathematical mindset that suits them to write that kind of story, right? And um, you know, you can see it in the way the characters are done. They're always like thumbnail essences of a character. They're not like their typical psychological realists kind of from the bottom upwards. They're more from the top downwards because they have that kind of slightly unrealistic but still thrilling, um, you know, um, black and whiteness, as it were. And when you guys write, I mean, I'm sorry, I haven't read any of your books, but I'm just curious. How do you think of your, your fiction from, a, that, from that kind of generic point of view? I mean, do you find it, uh, are you trying to be realistic psychologically or are you just trying to look for a great yarn that people, that people will take people away with, you know, away from their world, you know? Um, yeah, I, think I think what you're talking about there is really the distinction between what's typically thought of as the British approach to crime fiction versus the American approach to crime fiction. Okay. Where the British approach is more intellectual. It's more about the puzzle. Uh, right. Where the American approach is more about the emotions, more about the motivations. I see. Um, okay. And I've, I've done both. Uh, I've done the, the traditional classical whodunit, but I've also done the psychological uh, uh, approach. And I think that, frankly, uh, uh, I like the what we tend to refer to as the American approach better because it's more real. Um, you know, the, the, the whodunits in, in, in the real world don't happen. At least they don't happen with anything like the regularity that they happen in Cabot Cove, which is where Jessica Fletcher lived. Um, right. Well, that's interesting because I mean, as I say, I'm, 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 I haven't read much in this genre, but I mean, Chesson is like and Poe are like my kind of two, two kind of classical examples. But I mean, well, who would you recommend apart from yourselves? Can I ask to read to get a kind of a good flavor? Not necessarily contemporary, maybe even the last fifty years to get a kind of good flavor of how what you're talking about the American kind of approach to to this kind of genre. I mean, two or three names would be nice. Um, well, apart from yourself. Lee mentioned Lawrence Block. Right. Uh, I okay. mentioned Ed McBain. I would say read Lawrence Block, read Ed McBain. If you want something real contemporary, read uh, uh, Sean Cosby, who's relatively new. He's only got two books out. I think maybe three of the third one's coming out. Um, they're, by, they're published by S.A. Cosby. Crosby, Cosby, whichever. Okay. Not, okay. Cosby, like, you know, Bill. That guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think actually, you know, Josh was making it uh, American versus British. I think it's actually a time-based thing. I think British mysteries now, I mean, if you look at Morris and other characters, they're not as, as quite as um, 
puzzly as they used to be either. I think that was just the fashion back then to do puzzlier, more puzzles than it is now. So it's, well, I mean, it is, but, but it is a cliche that a lot of people who are kind of very kind of mathematically oriented like to read crime fiction. That's like, and you see it in the movies all the time. Um, and I, I will be fascinated by that because another author who didn't write as many myth, uh, crime stories, but probably could have, was the Argentinian genius Borges, right? And he was greatly influenced by Chesterton. And I think because of the same kind of being able to kind of get something done in a short period, you know, because Borges never wrote a novel, he wrote all, you know, he wrote mainly short stories. And um, it just fascinates me from a kind of, from a, from a makerly perspective. I write a bit myself, but not, not crime or mystery, but I'm always interested in the mindset that's behind a kind of story rather than a, any particular concrete story. Cause it just, it fascinates me to think about the way, different way people's minds work that, that, that are behind fiction, you know? So well, uh, I- My husband's a, a research psychologist or he, by training. And he did a book about motivating, uh, motivational theory and writers called Motivate Your Writing, in fact. Um, and most motivate, most writers, not the readers, but the writers all have the same kind of motivation, which is a need to influence people. But right. the read is very much based on their motives. And something like 90% of your time is broken up into three three major psychological motives. I'm going wild off the, off the, the track. No, here. this is great. I'm all about but this. I like this. Which tends to be romance readers, need for achievement, which is mystery readers, but it tends to be more the puzzle people or the, the traditional cozy mystery. But a need for influence people are more likely to read something like a thriller or something a little bit darker in their mystery. So it's it's really influenced a lot by your motivation more than it is just being mathematically inclined, it seems. Right. To. Well, D Dickens, I think, said that he wrote because he wanted to give him a sense of power. Yeah. You know, he could that he could impact people, that he could through his book kind of affect the world in a very powerful way. And I do think that's common to a lot of creative types. I think. I mean, it might sound mercenary, but I think it's true. We we all like this the I kick mean, of of working. you know. But you, but when you talk about a need to, for influence on people, you may be talking a writer because you'll buy my books. But you may be write a fan fiction writer who doesn't sell their books at all. Just as you, you know, in in the real world and politics, Mother Teresa had a huge. In a need for influence, but she wasn't, it was a different kind of influence. Right, I see, yeah. Well, I think we probably have quite a few other questions in the chat as well. Yeah. Maybe we can get to some Sorry, of sorry, points. sorry, sorry. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of comments also. Um, the three Bs of creativity, bed, bath, and bus. This is by yeah. Steve Kellner. Thank you, Steve. Um, we have a, um, right, we have a question here by Jay Kinney, uh, a question for Josh. Um, Jay asks, I'm curious about writing a short story based on a song. Is your approach to write a story that reflects the lyrics and assume your readers get the connection or something else? Well, I've done um, three now of these inspired by anthologies, uh, crime fiction inspired. And when I say I've done, I mean I've edited. And I wrote one of the story, I was the title story for each book. Um, so crime fiction inspired by the songs of Joni Mitchell, or Billy Joel, and Jimmy Buffett. And in each case, what I've told the contributors uh, is take the, the song as a jumping off point. Don't quote lyrics from the song because that's going to run into copyright issues. Uh, but I've invited and encouraged people to, uh, uh, oh, and the other don't is don't just retell the story of the song. Uh, people can just go and listen to the song if that's the story they're going to be exposed to. But what I've encouraged people to do is just allow the, the, the song to serve as a prompt and, and let them take it where it takes them. But to make it clear that this story would not have been written if it hadn't been for the song. That, mm -hmm. So that the, the story is truly inspired by the song. But then once that inspiration hits, you know inspiration is going to take you to places that might be rather far afield from the original source of that inspiration. I hope that's helpful, Jay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh. There's also another question. Uh, I believe this is for both of you. Do you read your book reviews and how do you deal with bad or good reviews? I do read mine. I probably shouldn't, but because a lot of people say, no, no, don't read them. But the good ones make me feel happy and the bad ones, I just insult them mentally. I, I, I don't <laughs> read them because there's been a, a 
few horror stories over the past few years of, of writers who hear, see bad reviews, and then they argue with them online. It's like, no, this is their opinion. They're entitled to their opinion. Leave them alone. Do not, do not argue with reviewers. Do not try to bully reviewers. Do not send all your followers to go pick on the reviewers. <laughs> just, just disagree with them and go about your merry way. Yeah, I, I read reviews. You know, short story writers don't get a lot of reviews. It's actually quite rare that you get a review, but because I also edit anthologies, the anthologies will get reviews. Uh, and I do read them and I enjoy reading them. And I, I don't know that they really ever have any particular influence on my mood. Uh, and I know they don't have any influence on my work. It's just one more data point uh, that, that's, that's interesting to, to be exposed to. Actually, one guy I know had a funny reaction to a review. He wrote a, a book, and his name is Troy Suits. He wrote historical baseball mysteries. And he had the character, uh, Mickey was his character, give a woman daffodils. And at that time, since this was historical, daffodils would not have been available at that time of year. He just messed up. So someone wrote a review and mentioned that. So like the next book he was working on, he's, he has the character go back to that woman and say, I brought you some daffodils. If you like the last one, she said, these are not daffodils. Daffodils will not grow at this time of year. He goes, yeah, what do I know? I'm a ball player. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to I have to tell you a story about a, a good friend of mine, uh, Les Roberts, who lives in Cleveland, Ohio, and who uh, has written 30-some novels about a Cleveland private eye named Mylon Yakovich. And uh, in one of his books, uh, Les has Mylon trail uh, a suspect to a Monday evening performance of the Cleveland Symphony. And he got, according to Les, hundreds of letters from Clevelanders pointing out that the Cleveland Symphony does not perform on Mondays. Now, somebody read, hundreds of people read a 300 page novel and that's what they took away from it, that the, the symphony was performing on the wrong night. And Les had printed up a form response that he mailed back to every one of these people. And his form response was, the Cleveland Symphony might not play on Monday nights, but my Cleveland Symphony plays whenever the hell I tell them to. So one more in the, in the box. I see one by Kaula. Kaula asked, um, I'm really curious as to when you started to enjoy writing. Were you always passionate about it? I have sitting on my desk, a, a, I think it's still on my desk. My desk is a mess, so who knows? Um, where I started doing a retelling of Thumbelina. It was basically the same story as the fairy tale Thumbelina, but I wrote out a new version of it. And my sister who was learning to type, typed it for me. I was in second grade. Oh. Was so, it a mystery Thumbelina story or was it a... It was, you know, it was much later when I started to write, trying to kill mystery. I remember I tried to write science fiction and fantasy. This was just Thumbelina's bog standard Thumbelina. Uh -huh. But you know, I wrote it myself, so. And I, drew, and I did draw the illustration. So that was in second grade. So I've never, I've been doing it and, and started really getting serious about it about junior high school and high school. Uh -huh. Well, I remember when I, when I was a ninth grader, my, my ninth grade English teacher, Mary Ryan, told me one day that I had to stay after the class. And I thought, oh God, what did I do wrong? <laughs> uh, and it turned out I hadn't done anything wrong, but uh, she wanted to give me a gift. And she gave me the June 1966 issue of Valerie Queen's Mystery Magazine. Now, I, had ne I probably had read some Sherlock Holmes, but otherwise I'd never read any crime fiction. So I have no idea why she thought I would enjoy this, but she did. And I did, and I started reading the magazine with regularity. And the next year, a story appeared which was open-ended. The police failed to solve the crime. But I read the story and I thought there was enough evidence in this story that the police should have solved the crime. So I sat down and I was 15 years old. I wrote a new ending to the story. I put it in an envelope and I mailed it off to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And a couple of weeks later, I got back a two page handwritten letter from Frederick Gamay, who was one of the two first cousins who wrote as Ellery Queen. And Fred was the editor of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. And he told me he thought that what I had done was very clever and he would share it with the original author of the story. And although I no longer have that letter, I, I burned into my brain are the last two sentences. He wrote, 
Have you ever considered writing a detective story yourself? Seems to me, Josh, if I may, you should. So of course I did. And it was it was that moment that I I I I started to to fall in love with the idea of, of writing based on that two sentence ending wow. of a letter from Hillary Queen. Wow, it's an amazing story. And true, unlike what I write. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Dr. Miriam Sette, who's joining us from Italy, has a question. Yes, Miriam, go ahead. Thank you, Rula. Uh, I have a question for Josh. Uh, first of all, congratulations to, to you, to Lee, and to Rula on this amazing interview. So my question is, Josh, when you spoke of uh, mystery, crime, or fantasy fiction as a means of uh, escaping from um, one's personal lives, I mean, um, uh, a reader escapes uh, wherever he likes uh, through uh, a strong narrative at a comfortable distance. So I, I wonder whether you uh, were recalling uh, um, Edmund Burke's uh, famous treatise of aesthetics uh, called uh, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. Um, uh, in this treatise, uh, he asserts that uh, when danger and or pain uh, press too um, nearly, they are um, incapable of giving any delight and are simply terrible. But at a certain distance and with certain modifications, they may be and they are delightful. So were you thinking of Edmund Burke and, and his uh, 1757 treatise? I would probably come across <laughs> as much more intelligent than I am if I were to say yes. But I'm going to be honest and say, no, regretfully, I was not recalling Edmund Burke's treatise. Well, it's, it's a very strange coincidence, but uh, no, I, I, if I have to be honest, I think you were thinking of him. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to say sure. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. You're welcome. Thank you, Miriam, for your question. Um, there's another question here uh, by Jane Jewell. Jane asks, how has the change in publishing over the past couple of decades affected your career and writing habits, sales, etc.? I'm referring to the move from print toward digital and audio, more independent and online publishers, etc. I think it's what's lovely about it is it keeps your books in print forever as you, if you want them to be. Um, like the, the Laura Fleming books and the Tilda Harper books came out, ebooks as such did not exist. So when I got, the, but you know, the books have been out of print and paper for years now. Um, but so my agency and I got the rights back and we now have published audio, uh, published digital editions. So they're still available, even though these books were meant, the first book came out in 93, but they're still available for people and I can still get readers and I can, and, and still make sales, which is nice too. Um, and so that's, that's lovely that you can actually have that access forever. Audio downloads have done kind of the same thing. I, all my books are available as audio and will stay in print, in print as audio books and download because they're, you don't have to worry about inventory. You don't have to worry about shipping and printing and all that. And that's wonderful to see because it kind of gives you a, what they call a long tail with your sales rather than just when they're in print and then it goes to used bookstores. Um, but that's all great. The bad I, I actually, I think it's all been pretty much wonderful. I, the the, the uh, if there's any downsides, I haven't really seen them yet. So, you know, it, of, sorry, Leah, I didn't mean to cut you off. I think with uh, electronic books, you can get into print so much faster too, and that's lovely. Coming at it from the perspective of a short story writer, I, I, I will say that when I started in the late 1960s, it was probably the worst possible time for short fiction writers, because in the, the 30s and in the 40s, there were all these pulp magazines that devoured short fiction. Uh, and it was, it was actually possible to make a living 
as a writer of short fiction, even though you were you were working for a half a penny a word. There was so much demand for the words that if you had the time and the determination to sit down and pound out thousands and thousands and thousands of words, you could you could earn a living. Most of those uh, pulp magazines were gone by the time I started. The exceptions were Ellie Queens and Alfred Hitchcock's, which still exist today, and a couple of others, uh, Mike Shane Mystery Magazine, um, the Saint Mystery Magazine, which have since disappeared. Uh, but now today, there's so much bigger a marketplace for short crime fiction, a lot of it online. There are online only publications like, for example, Shotgun Honey, uh, but there's also a lot more in the way of, of, of print publication. There's Black Cat Mystery Magazine, there's Mystery Weekly, there's Mystery Tribune. Uh, the marketplace has gotten much, much bigger. And then also, uh, it's possible uh, for people to, to put their own work online themselves using uh, a Kindle Direct, using Amazon Singles. Uh, so it's, it's a lot easier to get your work out in front of potential readers. Of course, you have to go back to something that I think it was Theodore Sturgeon who said a lot of years ago, science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon, who said that 95% of everything is garbage, and he didn't use the word garbage. He used a less polite word. Uh, and I think maybe now uh, the, the number's gone up. You know, maybe it, it, it's up to 98% of everything that you can find online is, is, is garbage. But boy, oh boy, it's, if you're willing to comb through uh, what's available, there's also a lot of gems out there that wouldn't have been out there in the 60s and 70s because the marketplace just wasn't big enough to support them. So on the whole, I would say from my perspective, uh, things are better today for writers than they, than they were when I was getting started because of the much greater number of possible avenues for getting your work out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that, that's positive, so sounds promising. Um, one last question, uh, which is a good last question. Do you have any words of advice? This is by Anubi Savarwa. Do you have any words of advice for a person who enjoys and would like to start writing? How do you get your butt in the chair and accept that what you start with probably won't be that great? Well, I don't think anybody's ever given better advice than one of the science fiction writers who Lee mentioned earlier, Robert Heinlein. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I can't quote them word for word, but if you were to do a Google search on Robert Heinlein, five rules for writers, they're very easy to find. Uh, and I can tell you that the first couple of them are number one, you must write. As, uh, I can't begin to tell you how many people, especially as a teacher, how many of my students come to me and, and spend more time telling me how much they want to write than they spend writing. Mm -hmm. Heinlein says you must write. He says you must finish what you write. Mm -hmm. And he says you must take what you have written and put it into the hands of somebody who's in a position to pay you for having written. And then he goes on and adds a couple more that again are easy to be found online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say the more writers you read about and, and, and listening to us and different processes, the more, the more likely you are to be able to find a process that works for you. Because Kipling, going back even further than Heinlein said, there are nine and 60 ways of writing tribal lays and each and every one of them is right. And I think that's the thing is you've got, you know, I've had writers say, oh, only write on, Wednesdays under a full moon and they're successful and then I've also heard people like I write every day nine to five and that's how you be successful and they're both wrong because it's whatever works for you so keep trying things um, I use a word count as my motivator to, to keep me on track some people count scenes some people count chapters um, some just go when that you know some do time there's all different ways you can go just keep trying things until you find something that works and stick with it if you start a new project and it's not working, my process for doing a short story is not quite the same as for a novel. Um, rewriting is not the same as writing in terms of how to set my goals. I'm big into goal setting. Um, and, and you keep evolving it to match your circumstances and to match your project. And, you know, just, you know, if, you're, if the first, first method you try doesn't work, don't think it means you're a terrible writer or a terrible person. You just haven't found your method yet. So. Just keep at it and have fun. I know Josh says he doesn't like writing, he likes having written, but I'm, I'm a big believer in doing what's fun. A lot of my career choices may not have been the best. 
I mean, going from mysteries to writing Irving, uh, co-editing Irving fantasy anthologies was not generally considered the right path <laughs> one would expect, but it was fun. And I'll try anything if it's fun. Thank you. And um, some final comments that uh, match what you both said, especially the uh, comments by Steve Kellner. Timelines rules. First, you must write. You must finish what you write. You must refrain from rewriting, except to editorial order. You must put the work on the market. You must keep the work on the market until it is sold. And, uh, oh, one more thing by Jane Jewell. What about the finances of publishing today? Royalties, advances, online payments. Do you have agents for short stories or handle it all yourself? Well, for short stories, I, it would be, first of all, foolish to have an agent. And second of all, uh, it would be foolish, I think, for an agent to take on a short story writer. There's just not enough money in it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, one of the greatest things a person who wants to be a writer can do, and this is to a certain extent limited by geography, is start going to the conferences that are out there. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned uh, Malice Domestic, uh, mm -hmm. Voucher Con, Left Coast Crime, Bodies in the Library in the UK. There are many, many others. And what begins to happen as you go to these conferences is that you meet writers, you get to talk to writers, but maybe even more importantly, you get to meet editors and publishers. Mm -hmm. And there is absolutely something, in fact, a lot to be said for having personal connections with people in the field. I don't think a personal connection has ever gotten me a sale, but it's gotten me a closer and faster read than I would have gotten if I had just sent something over the transom uh, into a slush pile somewhere. Those personal connections, I think, have real value. That's wonderful. I've, I've had two agents. Um, and my first agent kind of, she represented short stories. And basically, if I was selling a short story, um, she would go through the contracts and, and, and do the paperwork involved. She didn't sell the short stories per se. Um, and for most of the short stories I did well with her, was I was requested to send stuff to anthology. My current ad, agent um, does not handle the short stories, but he keeps an eye on them. And a couple of his authors have sold movie rights based on short stories. So he will represent those, but he doesn't take a cut of the money. So it just, it kind of depends. I, I agree, you really don't need a, an agent for a short story writer, but if you've got an agent, how they handle things, handle your short stories will depend on the agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to thank you both so much. This was such a fun and fascinating session. Thank you so much for all the, you know, for sharing your experiences with us and for the insightful advice that you gave everyone. Um, we certainly hope to see you again in some future indelible events. Um, and, um, you know, you've got fans in the audience, you've got people who want to know more about your work. So uh, I'll also be sharing your websites on social media. So there's an indelible page on Facebook. There's also an indelible page on Twitter and on Instagram. So uh, please follow us so that you could get more information about the writers that we host. And um, again, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, Lee and Josh, for this wonderful, wonderful session. And I also want to thank the audience for being here. Uh, there are so many comments and questions. But again, uh, you could also uh, contact and connect with the writers on social media as well. And you could take the, the discussion over there. So um, everybody have a great, well, I can't say everybody have a great evening because um, for Josh and Lee, I hope you have a wonderful day since it's early Sunday where you are. And um, for the rest of you, have a great evening. So we'll see you again very soon. Bye. Thank Bye. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank Josh. you. Bye. And bye, Jasper. <laughs>